For the next six years the prince partook of one meal a day, or of one meal every two weeks, or of one meal a month. Crossing his legs, he sat with a dignified posture and did not succumb to rain, wind, or thunder, remaining silent, he never trembled with fear. At times he clenched his teeth, pressed his tongue against his upper palate, and restrained his mind. Perspiration flowed from his armpits just as if he were being pressed down by a man of enormous strength, but his mind did not falter from exertion. His right mindfulness remained undisturbed, and instead of weakening, he was filled with energy and was spurred on by that great suffering. On one occasion, the prince practiced meditation without breathing. When he stopped breathing from the mouth and nose, the breath that had been trapped inside came rushing out of his ears with a tremendous noise. The noise was as loud as that of a blacksmith's bellows. When we went further and stopped the breathing of his ears, violent wind thrust upward against the top of the head, it was like being pierced by a sharp sword. On still another occasion, the violent winds trapped inside caused the head to ache as if it were being stabbed with a broken piece of pottery. At another time, he suffered violent temperatures as if a kitchen knife were being thrust into his stomach, or as if he had thrown his body onto a charcoal fire, and yet the prince's mind never wavered. Seeing this, one man thought that Gautama had died, another thought that he would die before long, and still another surmised that the prince had attained enlightenment and had entered the life of a sage. The prince then made up his mind to intensify his practice and to abstain from eating altogether. The celestial beings were taken aback and shouted, You must not abstain from eating. If you are determined to fast, we celestial beings will pour fluids into your pores and keep you alive. But the prince unwaveringly rejected their offer. The prince then ate only a small ration of beans, and before long he became emaciated. His arms and legs became like withered reeds, his buttocks like a camel's back, and his spine like a braided rope. His ribs protruded outward like the rafters of a broken down shack, and the skin covering his head became weather beaten like a half ripened gourd that had been scorched by the sun. Only his eyes, set deep in their sockets, sparkled like the stars reflected in a deep well. When we rubbed his stomach, he was able to grasp hold of his spine, and when he rubbed his spine, he was able to grasp his stomach. When he attempted to stand up, he reeled and fell down. The roots of the hair on his head rotted, and his hair fell out in clumps. The prince thought, No ascetic or mendicant in past worlds, in the present world, or in future worlds has ever undergone, is undergoing, or will undergo greater suffering than this. Thus the prince undertook practices that were unsurpassed by others in their excellence and that led to the abandonment of desire. He departed from traditional practices. For example, instead of washing his hands after meals, he licked his hands. He refused alms that were offered to him with the words, Please come in. Please take this. Again, he rejected invitations and refused to accept food from houses where dogs were kept or where flies swarmed about. He did not eat fish or drink liquor. He ate one meal a day or one meal every two or seven days. Gradually, he reduced the amount of food he ate and went without food for half a month. He ate such foods as cereal husk, grain chaff, rice bran, water plants, and rotted nuts and berries. For clothing, he wore burlap, hemp, clothes made of discarded cloth, tree bark, and animal skin. He undertook all manner of ascetic practices of self-modification, the plucking out of hairs on his head or in his beard, constant standing, constant squatting, lying down on a bed of thorns, rubbing oil on his body and pouring dust on it, parching himself near a fire, immersing his body in water and withstanding the cold, and so forth. In this way the grime of years fell off without being touched. His skin lost its luster and became ashen in color, like the color of a tree with old moss growing on it. He was careful not to take the leaves of living creatures, making certain that he did not step on even tiny insects. Having retired from the world, he avoided people, shunning even cowards, grass cutters, and woodcutters, and retreated deep into the forest, scorched by the sun, numbed by the cold, all alone. In the fearful forest, without clothing or fire, the sage sits in meditation with the radiant light of his ideals. The prince, moreover, slept at nights in the graveyard, where corpses and bones lay scattered or piled up in heaps. Shepherd's children caught sight of the prince and spat and threw mud at him, or, breaking off a tree branch, they thrust it in the prince's ear. But the prince's mind did not feel any anger toward these children. Undergoing such ascetic practices, he accomplished that which is difficult to accomplish, however, 
he was still unable to attain that dharma that transcends this world, he was unable to achieve divine wisdom. The prince, realizing now that these practices would not let him to release, that they would not extinguish suffering, and that they would not cause him to attain pure wisdom, decided to seek the path anew.